Good afternoon, everyone. Hello. Thanks so much for coming. Uh, my name is Glenn Adamson, and I am the curatorial director of Design Miami for 2024, and also will be for next year, 2025. It's such a pleasure to see you all here for what I know will be a fantastic conversation with our terrific panel here. I'm just going to briefly introduce them, and then we're going to have a conversation about design and wellness. So the subject here is how design interacts with this emergent and ever-expanding industry that's about the care of our bodies and our minds, our souls, and spirits. So we are actually talking about that here at Design Miami for the very first time. So this is a real pioneering conversation, and we have the right people here to lead it with us. So we are hosted here by Kohler, uh, the wonderful company uh, based in Sheboygan, Wisconsin. I used to live in uh, Wisconsin myself, in Milwaukee, so ne very near and dear to my heart. Um, and uh, we have with us uh, Katie, Katie Stevens, who is the general manager of the wellness uh, division of Kohler. And then uh, we have Dr. Jonathan Leary of Remedy Place, who's working with Kohler on a collaboration here in Miami. You'll hear a little bit more about that in just a second. And uh, then finally, we have Michelle Gagnon, who is the head of a founding and founder and head of Bioalchemy Olfactive. And she describes herself as a bioalchemist and olfactive artist. So we'll learn what that means in just a second. So, okay. So, first of all, um, Jonathan Katie, can you just very briefly let us know what you are up to here in Miami and the, tell us a little bit about the collaboration? Yeah, we're trying to change the narrative of how people socialize. So we wanted to create a beach club that was healthy. So every day from eight to four, we have a lineup of our ice bath that we just released with a live DJ set and a beautiful lounge. And all day, our coaches are guiding people through this experience. And it's just been so cool to watch because most people haven't done an ice bath before. And they're all so nervous and scared and we've convinced them all to get in. And every single one of them has hit six minutes and they, have been like, I am so happy that I did that. Uh, so just to have just those small moments that are like those aha moments where it changes their perspective and shifts the awareness mm -hmm. and shows them that we can have a blast during the day without having some alcohol. So it's been a huge success and people are absolutely loving it. Just one uh, quick thing about the no alcohol. So that's actually quite, that's a bit of an aside, but it's actually quite important because what you're really thinking about is different ways of creating both stimulation and relaxation through means that are less toxic to us. So can you say just a little more about that? Yeah, I think it's about, I mean, we call it self-care entertainment. If you think about how most people come together, it is usually over food and alcohol but alcohol is a depressant and a dissociative. So when people feel alone, they feel isolated and they don't have strong connections. If you think of the only thing they're doing to connect mm. is alcohol, which is actually disconnecting them. Where if you go in an ice bath or a sauna or any of our self-care experiences, you're amplifying your physiology and it's actually bringing out the best part of you. Um, and then being able to share that with people that you love is a beautiful moment. And once you make a habit out of it, it actually makes change, and it's yeah. it's simple and fun. You get in that positive feedback loop. Yeah. Okay. And Katie, um, from the Kohler perspective, why work with uh, Remedy Place? Why work with Dr. Jonathan Leary? Yeah, it's a great. I mean, it's a great question. So we embarked um, probably a little over two years ago now on um, wanting to get into the wellness space. It's kind of it is core to our DNA. We don't talk about it a lot, but. Um, Kohler does have a hospitality business that um, has uh, wellness at its core, and we knew to really have a compelling product portfolio in the space, we needed to partner with experts. And who better than Dr. Leary here, really an expert in his space, helped teach us about the ergonomics of ice bath, um, how to do it properly for the right amount of time to yield the greatest benefit. So it was really a no-brainer for us, and we're excited to continue to collaborate and continue to develop really premier product experiences with him. And for those that don't know Kohler well, I, everyone knows Kohler to some extent, can you just sketch a little bit of the overall shape in which the wellness initiative is sitting? So yeah, how do you connect to the many I'd, other parts I'd of the company? I'd love to. Yeah. So um, Kohler's a 151-year-old company. Um, our roots are in plumbing. But like I mentioned, we have a hospitality uh, business which provides luxury spa services at its core. And, and like I said, within the last year, we've taken on the task, the very exciting task of developing a wellness product portfolio. 
So it's really leveraging um, experiences we're already delivering in the bathroom, self-care, and really leveling it up a, a notch um, to help us get started on our journey to complement development of ice bath. We also had the great privilege of being able to acquire a German sauna company in January. So that's been another um, key development catalyst for us in the space. Um, Kloffs is a 70-year-old um, traditional German, German sauna company, experts in their field, uh, market leaders. So we've had that great privilege of learning the sauna space complementary to ice bath and other wellness experiences. Okay, thanks. And so Michelle, you describe yourself as an olfactory artist. Um, that's probably a new concept for a lot of us. So can you say a little bit about what that is and what your, um, what your project is all about? Yeah. So um, I've studied nasal kinesiology and scent therapy. I got into my practice through working with natural aromatics extracted from plants um, for medicine, so for wellness. And so that connects us all here. And um, the quality became really important to me. So I started studying distillation, alchemy, extraction techniques. And through that, I've been so inspired by the communities that I'm working with, the, the distillers, the farmers, the places, the land, the flowers, the plants, and realize and recognize that we don't have a lot of discussion or design for our sense of smell, and how can we take that to the next level? And so we do a lot of aromatic design work that is echoing a design feel of a space, and we think about how all of our senses operate together. So we're creating a lot of aromatic products, aromatic experiences, aromatic art, um, in consideration of all of the senses, but of course I'm focusing on the, on the nose. So w give us an example. So uh, what I'm imagining is you might have a hotel lobby, for example, and then the question is how do you infuse that space with smell that might work on people almost subliminally? Is it that kind of thing? Yeah, I mean, there's different ways to engage with scent. Some are sort of subconscious experiences where the scent is invisible and it'll be in the HVAC. Uh -huh. Other times it's more of a conscious engagement, which can leave an even like a deeper impression on the brain, on memory and emotion, where there's passive diffusion. We did a project with Remini Place where we have these cork remnants that we are sculpting, molding, shaping, burning with fire, imbuing with scent, and creating rituals within the property and the clothes where these pieces of cork get scented, and that's a passive diffusion. Okay. So there's fun ways to play and innovative ways to experience scent and how it can affect us, whether it's art, whether it's sculpture, whether it's through the, through the air system. Mm, okay. So, yeah. so you know, one thing we'll be talking about in a minute is how we think about this somewhat intangible concept of wellness or an intangible like scent uh, or cold or heat, these things that really don't have a kind of physical object quality and how we relate that to the design field that Design Miami is so devoted to. Um, before we get on to that, I just wanna have a little moment of definition. So I wanna ask each of you to define the term wellness. Um, and I have a feeling you might have slightly different definitions, so it would be interesting to compare and contrast. Katie, would you mind starting? I, I don't mind. And in fact, I was thinking about this, and there are probably 40 or 50 different definitions yeah. if you went around the room. But um, for me, wellness is really simple. It's very personal, and it's, it's what you do to keep your mind and, and body in its best form. And, mm. and for everyone, that can mean something different, or that can be achieved in a different way. Okay, Jonathan? I define wellness by, it's anything that enhances your physiology in a positive way. And I think there could okay. be, like Katie said, there's a million ways to define wellness and it's such a blanket term now because it's everywhere. And I think you can look at health and wellness in such a unique way because it could be the environment, it could be the scent, it could be just hanging out and having that human connection. Um, but there's a lot of things that add to your physiology and a lot of that take away. And I think it's a really nice, simple definition that people really connect with. Can I just ask a follow up to you, Jonathan? I was struck by a definition that's offered on your website. It's not really a definition, it's more of a mission statement that says that your that remedy place is about putting people's health in their own hands or encouraging people to take their health into their own hands. Can you say a little bit more about that question of personal responsibility and how that correlates to the concept of wellness? Yeah, I mean, no one's gonna make you healthy other than you, and I say your body's your number one asset, and most people don't even know how their body works, never mind how to take care of it, and it's mind-blowing. And I think we haven't set people up for success because we were just taught, you know, as long as you move, you eat kind of healthy, that you're just well, but that's not 
necessarily true, and it's so much more than that. And I think we've just gotten to a place where people are so sick that we're talking about prevention and like we're just saying over and over again, like we just, we don't make sure you're being healthy so you don't get sick. And I'm like, that the goal of health is not only to not get sick, but health is a tool to allow you to perform. And my background sports medicine and I had to get my athletes to perform on the field, but we're all performing in life. And when you start to realize that the healthier you are, the more successful you are in every vertical of your life, it's so powerful. And whether it's your relationships, whether it's how you communicate, your happiness, your creativity, everything is amplified and there's no limit. So when you realize that every day can be better, it just makes a better and better version of yourself. And you know, you have one, one life and this is your opportunity to take control and, and bring out your uniqueness and your impact that you can add to the world. I feel better just listening to you talk about that. That's amazing. Um, uh, Michelle, what do you think about the term wellness? I assume you use it in your practice. How do, would you define it? Yeah, absolutely. I, um, I mean, my, my work is rooted in wellness. I think that we can't, you know, this, the origin of fragrance is a space where fragrance and pharmacy are synonymous. So when we're working with natural aromatic materials, they're innately connected to, to wellness. They have, um, they have a holistic effect on our whole well-being, emotional, spiritual, physical, social even they can be. And so I think wellness comes in all forms and shapes and sizes, but I primarily think about wellness through the senses, engaging the senses, which really invite us to be in a moment, whether it's a place, a time, a, a wellness journey, to be more present. And I think that heightened sensory awareness is a path to, to wellness. So uh, just to get technical for a second, when you smell a scent, what's actually happening in your body? Yeah, when we smell, we're actually smelling with our brains. So we don't really smell with our nose, it's just the, the vessel. And um, think about everything we smell as chemicals, whether they're natural, whether they're synthetic, they're still made of chemical compounds, which act as these like little messengers to the brain and communicate a message on how to, how to react, how does the brain, how does the body respond. So we process scent in the same part of the brain as memory and emotion, which is really, really powerful because that's why we can, we can smell something and it takes us back to a moment in time as if no time has passed at all. And so when we start to understand that scent is directly linked to memory and emotion, we can use that as a tool to create more memorable experiences, to enhance a feeling, an emotion at an event, at a place, at a time. Um, and we can use it really for, uh, for, for our own benefit. It's what's so interesting about that description too, Michelle, is that I suppose when you see something, it still remains external to you, or when you hear something. I mean, maybe it makes your ears vibrate, but when you smell something or taste something, which of course are very strongly correlated, aren't they? You're actually literally changing your body chemistry like something's physically happening that alters you. Yeah, it's one of it's our, our sense of smell and taste are our two chemical senses. And right. so when we smell, we are putting whatever we're inhaling in direct contact with our brain, mm -hmm. constantly monitoring the world around us. And oftentimes, I mean, 85% of what we're tasting, we're actually smelling. We so often mistakenly describe what is actually fragrance as flavor, but the fragrance is what makes something herbaceous or floral or... Or, or, you know, yeah. rich and green and fresh or whatever it is, it's, it's the aromas. Right. So they're so intimately connected, but um, the, our sense of smell is one of the most, is our prim most primordial sense. Right. You know, we just had, uh, our last talk was with Perry Jouet, the champagne company, and um, I'm sure they would totally agree with that. Of course, it's all about <laughs> the aroma and the kind of psychology yeah. and the emotional uh, makeup that you have after you've ingested that amazing liquid. So. Um, okay, so let's talk about wellness now. So we just talked about wellness kind of in the abstract. So now is not just any time. We obviously had the COVID pandemic, right? Uh, we have digital technology in our lives. We have a globalized economy that is sending uh, all sorts of things around the world, including pathogens and other things that are negative, lots of things that are positive. So I guess we might start from the presumption that we're at a very volatile moment and maybe quite a challenging moment in the history of wellness. So Jonathan, if I could start with you, I know you've thought about this a lot. Um, how would you frame it? You know, if you were writing the history of wellness, how would you write the current chapter that we're in? I think this is the inflection point. I mean, it, 
we're the sickest that we've ever been. Like last year, the top eight chronic conditions in the US reached an all-time high. So we've made so many advancements in medicine and surgery and that's saving lives, but it's not making people healthy. So a chronic means not life-threatening, is that right? Yeah, okay. well, and life, so yeah, they are life-threatening. They are life-threatening. Yeah, so I think what's interesting is we're at a moment where the awareness has shifted. The pandemic, the one good thing that came out of it, as if we try to shed some positive light, is that it made people realize that no one can make them healthy. And it, it really drove so much, like through even social media and everything out there digitally, there's more eyes on every single thing in the health and wellness space than ever before. And at the end of the day, these, a lot of these things have been around for a long time, but it hasn't had the right awareness. And if people don't feel good and you can give them one experience that makes them feel better, why wouldn't they do it again? And you know, if you look back in time with meditation or acupuncture or chiropractic, there would never be an ad, there would never be a commercial. You know, Big Pharma has unlimited funds to market, um, but now with a social media post, you can have tens of millions, hundreds of millions of views, and people are vulnerable. They want answers, they're seeking advice, they don't want to have to be on medication if they don't have to be. They don't want to have to get surgery if they don't have to be. So I think now people are going to understand the importance of it's just them taking care of themselves and to learn how to do so. And I think there'll be a gigantic shift to alternative medicine and self-care experiences as the primary, um, you know, like the first line of intervention. Mm-hmm. You know, you should exhaust other options before just jumping into a surgery or, or a drug. Um, and then those are there to save lives or to be an intervention if the other things aren't working. Right. So partly it's about not depending on this kind of institutionalized medicalization and really, again, taking personal responsibility. Yeah. Um, so many questions about this. Uh, yeah, go ahead. And one more, and then the importance of human connection. I mean, now right. yeah. what's really cool to see is we've always known that there's a positive correlation between mental health and human connection. But with the pandemic, one of the biggest things we learned was it actually affects your physical health. And if you look at the past 20 years, the statistics on every human interaction, whether it's with a partner, whether it's with friends, whether it's with family, every, every one of those is drastically down. So we're more digitally connected than ever before, but we have less human interaction. And now they're correlating the chronic diseases and illnesses based on those isolating factors. And something, you know, they just released a research article this year that showed if you're purely isolated, it's actually the equivalent of six alcoholic beverages per day. So in my practice, the reason why we turned Remedy into a social wellness club was because all of my patients over five years said the same thing. Dr. Leary, I feel incredible, but you're ruining my social life. They're like, I've made all these lifestyle changes, but now I can't do anything fun. I'm not going out on dates, I'm not going to that event. And I was like, why is it that everything we do when we socialize has a negative impact on our health? And I was like, all right, let me study the impact of now being isolated and how detrimental that is. And I'm not saying go and, go and drink, I'm saying that now you can socialize, not drink, but we need to get people back together. And I think that's why you're seeing so much buzz around human connection and community, because if we don't have that, we will get sicker. And Harvard just released an 80-year-old study on the correlation of human connection on longevity, and it actually could be one of the most important things for our health. Right. Just one other thing to pick up on that you kind of alluded to there was the fact that you can have lots of eyeballs on something that's actually quite misleading or even fraudulent. So I suppose another thing that's bound up with digital, digital technology is a kind of lack of responsibility that's in the space. So how do you personally navigate towards the authentic and the reliable science and experiences? And how do you think in general we could avoid the kind of fake news version of wellness? Yeah, it's really complicated. Um, And there's not an easy way to answer that. I think, you know, whether it's supplements, they're loosely regulated, so it's hard to even know what you're you're getting. Um, I think anything that sounds gimmicky or too good to be true, listen to it. There's not a magical supplement or magical experience that's gonna just make you healthy. I think being healthy is hard work and it's an ever going thing that you always have to do. And it's a lot simpler than we think. Um, We make it very complex. And I think, I wish I had like a a resource that would tell you what is is accurate or not accurate, but it's just really not there. Um, 
but I would say at the end of the day, focus on things that do take time and that do take hard work. Mm -hmm. um, and it's really simple. It's if you just got your steps in every day, had 10,000 steps, if you looked at anything you put in or on your body as enhancing you or working against you, and then you just did simple techniques like breath work, um, some of these things are so simple, mm -hmm. uh, but so impactful. Yeah. Um, I'd love to get back to that idea of simplicity in a second with you, Michelle. But first, Katie, can I ask you to speak to that question of essentially the, the legitimacy of wellness and how Kohler handles that question of reliability? Yeah, it's a, I mean, it's a great question. So, you know, when I spoke earlier of the choice to partner with Dr. Leary on development of our first wellness product, I really didn't speak to the fact that it was super intentional. Like we wanted to partner with someone that was credible and understood the science and was well researched. And that really, that kind of practice of um, understanding the science has sort of permeated throughout our development of our wellness portfolio. Like we have a biomedical researcher on staff. Um, she really pours over the research. And what's so interesting about the space is there's a lot of really credible research, but there's also a lot of areas where research just hasn't been done. A lot of opportunities to kind of see that through and benefits we believe to be true. Um, that we want to see researched and proven out. So it's been a very methodical, intentional approach from our perspective and actually really fun to learn. So is Kohler actually directly involved in research in its own right? We are doing some of our own research, um, partnering with universities and academic in institutions as well. I would say we've kind of just dipped our toe in the water. We've not taken the big plunge, so to, so to speak. But yeah, The ice bath um, of academia. The ice yeah. bath of academia, but um, we know it's we know it's needed so we're starting that journey i suppose there's there's almost a political context to this too right because expertise itself has become this kind of um you know kind of hot term in our culture and so it's also about just uh i don't know legitimizing the process of, uh, process of legitimization if you see what i mean yeah i think what we're trying to do with remedy is use our club and our guests as a way to have our own clinical evidence. You know, I've always had my practice to know what worked over X period of time, and I've always tested out myself and my patients, but last year, just with two clubs, we did over 67,000 appointments. You know, as we can start building a digital infrastructure to actually show the effectiveness and efficiency between the clubs that we're creating and as product collection grows, that could become the biggest data pool of clinical evidence and market research that we could do firsthand. And now with things like wearables, you don't have to wait for a research, research article to come out. You can see if you had drinks last night, did it affect your sleep? You know, you can see your stress levels. It's really amazing. And I think that emerging market is going to become so impactful because in real time, you can learn your body. And I think tying that into spaces or, you know, big companies, there's so much that you can actually start to gather. And that way you don't have to wait for the research to come out, you can do your own research. And I think that's a, yeah. a great tactic that we're and excited because about. It is personal and it's about you, right? So that's also interesting that digital technology is sort of pushing in both directions because it can distract us and make us feel terrible and it can also inform us about ourselves. And it's hard because people say, you know, how long should I go in an ice bath? And I'm like, that's like asking me how much weight should you lift in the gym? Like, we're all different. Yeah. Or if you said, how long of a run should I go on? All of us are gonna run a different length. Yeah. And like something like an ice bath is a training. Like we use resistance in the gym to be strong, but we're using resistance with cold to train your thermoregulators in your mind. And I think your health is so much more complex and yeah. what works for you might not work for me. So I think that's with the wearables and the biometrics that can really help dictate. Yeah. So, Michelle, um, I want to get back to something Jonathan said a moment ago about simplicity. And one thing I was very struck by in your um, work is that you used the word alchemy, which implies to me this kind of going back to the roots and to ancient, maybe even medieval forms of knowledge that maybe have been neglected. Is part of what you're thinking about a kind of recovery of older knowledge? Yeah, it's a huge part of what I'm thinking about. and. Um, a lot of the work that we do with indigenous communities in the Amazon jungle and communities around the world is accessing that ancestral knowledge, that, that deep and intuitive knowing of what plants are medicine and for what and how to use them. 
and share that and keep that practice alive and use it in this modern day where these, these methods are tried and true for thousands and thousands of years. So a lot of these ancient practices and traditions, whether it's around meditation practices or cleansing the air of a space or antibacterial, antimicrobial, I mean, talking about COVID, it brought a lot of light to, um, to the work that I'm doing, especially with a sense of smell and sort of tapping back into that and understanding the importance of it. So scent is something that's been celebrated for ceremony, ritual, and traditions for ever since humans have been alive and coexisting with plants. We've been working with scent. So I think that my practice is, it's simple in the sense that it is accessing um, knowledge that has been there for, for centuries and trying to bring that back into our everyday lives. That point about ritual strikes me as very interesting too. And we're sort of inching our way towards talking about design in a second here. And ritual is kind of the gateway to design. And I suppose the thing that everybody always thinks about is the, the cliche version is burning sage, right? To cleanse a place. Um, but obviously that had a very, you know, profound religious con you know, connotation. And so many, as you say, so many other scent experiences were once understood in spiritual terms and ceremonial terms. And now we live arguably in this much more secular environment. And so is it to some extent a, a question of recovering those kind of spiritual human insights in this less overtly religious context? I mean, I think that that scents have been used, yes, for spiritual practices, for religious practices, for ceremony, celebration, I mean, preparations for the body in, in so many ways. But I think that it's about thinking of scent and the senses as a holistic practice and not in isolation. So part of the conversation I like and what I like to think about is how all of our senses operate together and not independently of one another, which I think we so often think of them as operating independently, and they're not. They're always in constant communication. And it's something I love, thinking about like synesthesia. Like what does a color smell like? What does a texture smell like? And that kind of goes into the, the conversation about design and scent, but it's like how do we think of our senses as a team and operating efficiently together? Right. Okay, so let's talk about design. So Katie, Kohler is a design company, first and foremost in some ways. So you seem well positioned to address this. How do you understand the relationship between design as a field and wellness as a field, and where do you see the opportunities in that connection? Yeah, it's a, it's a really provocative question. I think, um, you know, for us, it's, it's always putting the user at the center of everything. So we've talked about design or wellness being very personal. It's, it's something different for every single individual. And with every product we develop, um, and we've taken those great lessons from prominent product development and, and springboarded that into wellness product development, we put the user at the center of everything. So rather than, again, trying to put that strict definition around what wellness is and achieving that, we've um, really uh, aimed at putting the user at the center of it. We spend countless hours on human factors studies. That's actually one of my most favorite parts of the job is trying all the different form factors for ice bath as an example. And we try to, through that, accommodate the broadest range of body types and um, demographic age to ensure that we're delivering an experience that can be very personal to that user and feels as if it was designed for that individual. And are you in the wellness um, section of Kohler? Are you working very actively with the design team at Kohler? Is that one yeah, of the conversations? Yeah, we actually, we have a lead designer on, on staff and we partner very closely with the much broader design community at Kohler Company. So, oh, so there's there's somebody who's the designer There's someone for on my team oh, wow. that is our lead wellness designer. Wow. He wakes up every day thinking about wellness, mm. the experiences that we need to deliver and how to design wow. um, the form factor that, that suits that experience. Okay, that sounds like a growth industry. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Okay, uh, Jonathan, how do you think about design as a factor in the wellness picture? Yeah, I think it plays a huge role. Um, at our clubs, we say that we're designed to heal. And that really came from I never wanted to work in a hospital setting. It's not enjoyable for the doctor. It's not enjoyable for, for the patient. There's a thing called white coat syndrome. I mean, you walk in, your heart rate goes up, your body tenses. If you are not well or you want to be well or you want to optimize your performance, 
going into an environment that's working against you doesn't make sense. So I think there's a huge opportunity to look at every environment that we're in and how do you actually enhance that environment so passively when you're just even just in that room, you're being enhanced. And I think you can look at every single part of your day and look at every single room or every single vessel and you find out, oh wait, how can I manipulate that environment with design, with what applies to our senses? And you actually can just be enhancing your performance throughout the whole day. I mean, if you think of it from the automotive space to airplanes to your bathroom to living room, I mean, every single space could be optimized and it hasn't been done. And if you just look at our healthcare system just as a whole, there's no reason why hospitals have to look like that. You know, if you look at, and then it's not just about where you go to be healthy. Think about every environment where you socialize, where you connect with people you love. And I think we haven't even started. I think it's a whole open market. Yeah, I, I often compare it to writing in Hollywood. And it's like, why isn't the writing better in movies? You know, because writing should be really the thing that's not free, but so inexpensive, comparatively speaking. And I always feel like design is that. It's the variable that you can bring into the equation to make everything better. But it's such low investment, high impact, you know. And I wonder what you think about or what you've learned from working directly with designers, because of course, Remedy Place, you have these beautiful environments. I assume you're working with designers and architects to achieve them. Yeah, so I, I design the clubs, <laughs> um, but our contractor's wife does the plans, okay. and I'm not you know, a professionally trained designer. I just had a very clear vision of what I wanted it to be, and it was really just inspired by, I, was, I had my concierge practice, I was treating patients out of their homes, and I started to notice how fast they were healing and I started to analyze that because it wasn't just my treatments. You know, if I go into my patient's home, their guard's down. It's their comfort zone. So those barriers, especially when you're dealing with people in pain, I didn't have to go through those initial stages to break down those walls to even start the treatment. And I think that's kind of what, what sparked it all. So you're actually the guy sitting down and making the drawings and specking the materials? Down to every material. <laughs> wow, right. right now. But now, you know, we're... We're opening our fourth club in March, uh, and we're working on our fifth club, and now we're looking at really bringing on an amazing design agency yeah. to push it to the next level. Um, so I'm excited because the fifth club is almost a whole new concept, mm -hmm. and I just want to bring that to the world. Could you just give me one minute on materials? I'm super interested in materials and their affect. Yeah. Um, how did you think about materialization of these ideas? Yeah, I mean, anything from color to organic materials to like, Things like Venetian plaster. We line all of our walls with Venetian plaster, okay. not just because it's gorgeous, because it also blocks EMF. So not great for... Um, you might want to define EMF just in case. Yeah, these are the frequencies that are in the air that can be actually harmful to us. Yeah. And those EMF coming off most electrical, yeah. most electrical stuff. Um, so it's not great for Wi-Fi in the club, but you know, you know that every room lined in that Venetian plaster is one barrier that is helping yeah. that not hit you. And I think that's can be really interesting. Well, having a little time off Wi-Fi might not be a bad thing either, so yeah, yeah. Or even too, like with the scent, working with Michelle, we spent about a year and a half making our scent, and we didn't want to just disperse it in the air, we wanted to use art as a way for people to experience the scent. So we have these aged burnt cork pieces that every day the team paints. Mm -hmm. So it's this really cool aromatic ritual that the first and last thing every guest experiences is a scent that is truly designed to heal, mm. that is enhancing their physiology. Which is freshly applied. Yeah, okay. And so Michelle, you have obviously had that relationship, but you must have a lot of incredibly interesting conversations with architects and interior designers now. So can you say a little bit about that? Yeah, it's really exciting, I think, to bring the conversation of aromatic design into the design space. Um, with great consideration to how do we design for the senses? Mm -hmm. How do we create a scent that smells like this place feels or how it looks? And one of the questions I always ask is, what do we want people to feel when they're in this space? It's never what do we want people to smell? Right. Because it's all about evoking feelings, evoking emotions, and creating new memories within that space. So um, I, I love working with other creatives. I love working with designers, architects, and visionaries. and. Um, with John and I, it was a really, really exciting and fun process that we went through for 
a year maybe <laughs> yeah, too long it was it was on me though and it's there's a lot of education involved because i think that mm-hmm. we're actually so we're really disconnected to our sense of smell unfortunately and we're in a world where we're so inundated with synthetics and chemicals that few of us actually know the true smell of a rose or of sandalwood or some oh, of these wow, incense right. materials and so Working with Remedy was a fun, it was a fun exploration because we want, like John was saying, we want people to feel welcome, warm in the space, right? It's not this sterile environment that's very antiseptic and and cold. We want it to be warm, welcoming. The architecture, there's lots of curves and, and there's like very voluptuous shapes. And so the scent has rounded edges. We have bay, which is very warming, very, um, good for circulation we have jasmine flower which is very robust and creates this like dynamic almost sexiness the clubs if you guys have seen the clubs i mean they're very sexy and um and then we're working with some of the ancient aromatic incense materials which are great for meditation quieting the mind really supportive for breath work and the respiratory system so it's a very thoughtful aromatic design that goes through many different phases and many different formulations, reformulations, feeling it, closing your eyes. How does this feel? Where do we feel it in the body? And, and exploring that. But it is a conversation also I have with myself when I'm formulating is like, what do these colors smell like? What do these materials smell like? Is there a lot of wood? Okay, there's a lot of plaster. Do we have warm tones? Is it cool tones? And so all of these elements are considered in the design process. Okay, so a lot of examples there about how going back to basics, as it were, actually, you know, excavates all this complexity that people used to almost take for granted or they lived inside it and we've completely walled ourselves off from it, haven't we? Well, and to, to build on that, you know, 95% of scents in America are synthetic compounds. Wow. And if I, I do all my patients' blood work and I see a lot of results and our hormones are worse than ever before and synthetic compounds are endocrine disruptors. And if yes. you're spraying a scent on your skin, on your clothes, in, on your furniture, those things are actually chemically affecting us. Yeah. So I think it's also important just to talk about how you yeah. have your raw ingredients. Exactly, the sourcing. I mean, the quality is the most important because we want these materials, like, yes, they smell good, but beyond smelling good, we want them to function. Mm. And so sourcing, I mean, not only are, I would say almost like 95% of even essential oils, 95% of what we think is natural in the aromatic space is adulterated. So this put me on what is a lifelong and never-ending quest of traveling around the world and working directly with farmers, distillers, communities, and getting to know not only the quality of the material, but the whole circular effort in the making of these materials. What are we giving back to? How are we you know, working with the land, using what the land gives us, but also giving back to the land? So a lot of the, all of the materials that we work with are biodynamic, sustainably wildcrafted, or organic, organically harvested, mindfully cultivated. And so this becomes really important as well. That's also part of the wellness conversation is how are we giving back to the communities? What are the charitable initiatives? And, um, and so that I think, you know, the reason we work exclusively with natural aromatics, which is very unique. I think we might be the only aromatic design lab working exclusively with natural aromatics is because the synthetics are endocrine disruptors. We're now starting to see some of the effects of these chemicals that we're putting on and in our body on a daily basis, right? I mean, a lot of these are part of our routine. What we put on our skin, how we treat our bodies, our bath rituals, our rituals in, in, in the home. And so there's so many ways to create wellness just within, within our own self-care, within our own home practices that are simple, also so much more pleasurable and joyful, not just the way it smells, but the way it feels on the skin. And so mm. it's, um, we do focus strictly on naturals and try to avoid, you know, people say they get headaches with scent. Well, we use a lot of our scents to treat headaches. Right. So it's, it's a completely different approach to aromatic design that's at the core for our well-being, actual medicine. You know, one thing that seems really important about what you're all saying is that as the wellness industry has increased, of course its social footprint has increased, its economic footprint has increased, and obviously that can be good or bad. And what you're saying is that we need to be very mindful in terms of how this uh, industry in itself is affecting communities. So and, and the environment. And the environment at large, mm-hmm. right, right. Let's talk about another um, side of this with respect to design, which is what the 
implications or the kind of knock-on effects of the rise of the wellness industry might be for other fields of design. So I'll just give one example, which we're actually sitting inside of right now. Um, so we worked very closely with Alchemist Paints, which is this fantastic company that makes effectively artisanal minerally based uh, paints. And I got to name the, the paint. So for example, this one is called Robin's Egg after Craig Robbins, our founder at Design Miami. Uh, we have Bauhaus Afternoon, we have Paris Calderon because of Mathieu Lehenor, so it's super fun for me. Um, but also, I think people, even without being consciously aware of it, can feel the affect of being in the space because the paint is so special and it has this kind of quality. So that's a non-aromatic, but very close example to what we've been talking about. Katie, when you think about wellness as a kind of variable in design, where do you see the implications going for furniture, for architecture, for textiles? Yeah, it's a fantastic question. Um, I, I've got sort of two points on the topic. So number one, you know, mentioning that we put the user at the center of everything, that wasn't new to uh, you know, us embarking on wellness design. That has been part of the Kohler DNA and, and so now I think we've learned so much through wellness that can cascade back into plumbing design, again, around you know, creating experiences using materials that are safer for consumers. And then I think you know, kind of parlaying that into a second point is you know, one of the things that keeps me up at night about designing our wellness experience is an unintended consequence. The communities that we impact is you know, how do we create solutions that are sustainable? We're consuming a lot of energy. Um, we are using a lot of water. And how do we do that in a way that we're not compromising the experience, um, but actually uh, leaving a more sustainable or less impactful footprint behind in doing so? So I think you know that's already core to our DNA from a design perspective, putting the user first and how do we do it sustainably? And I think you know we're just going to continue to see more of a circular dynamic there as we learn more. Right. Okay, Jonathan, where do you see the impact of wellness broadly in the design field? Yeah, I think we're going to look at every single detail and look at it as a way of almost like a scale. Like like I was saying before, is it enhancing you or is it working against you? And I think you can honestly look at every single detail. And I think as the awareness shifts, there'll be more money that can be invested in testing and learning. And it's happening so fast. And with attention to this, we can't deny people basic human rights. If we start learning what can impact us in a healthy way, these simple things are a lot more affordable than surgery and drugs. Mm -hmm. And if you start thinking of how fast this is changing, that's what I say, it's such an exciting time because with more money, there's, I mean, with more attention, there's more money and more awareness. And I think everyone, everyone's so excited and passionate about it once they start. When you start feeling good, you start loving wellness. And I think everyone's becoming passionate in wellness. Right. And that's going to help create a movement that's so much bigger than, you know, I ever dreamt. So that's the inflection point you mentioned earlier. Can I just ask you, um, this is a little bit of a geeky question, but I wanted to ask you to distinguish what we're talking about here from ergonomics. Yeah which is this kind of 60s idea, which may be the big moment when suddenly body mechanics entered the design field and people started thinking about seating posture and they invented the air on chair and all that, right? So this is a story we know in the design field very well, but we're talking about something much larger here and much more encompassing, aren't we? Yeah, I mean, movement cures. If you're in pain, it's because something isn't moving properly. So how our bodies position, and if you just look of the evolution of time, our posture is getting worse and worse because everything that we're doing is in front of us. You know, our texting, eating, driving, so we're getting more and more hunched over, which is causing more imbalances. More imbalances lead to improper movement. Improper movement leads to pain or increased risk of getting injured. So I think, just like I was saying, every single design detail can work against us or for us. Ergodynamics is so important because if you stop moving, you start dying, and that's true, you know. I think it's 90% uh, of elderly people over 70 die within a year if they break their hip. And it's because we stop moving. And I think if you don't have movement, you don't have blood flow. If you don't have blood flow, you don't have oxygen and nutrients. Yeah. So it's essential, if not the most important thing. Yeah, so many of us have seen this in our families. Of course, it's, it's very, very serious business we're talking about. You know, I recently had the opportunity to curate an exhibition about Nike 
Nike, yeah. the, the shoes, not the goddess of victory. Um, and um, it was really interesting talking to their designers about these issues, and of course all their technologies, Nike Air and so on. It's all about creating a kind of positive vector in terms of movement, whether that's athletic performance or if it's everyday life. But I was very struck by the fact that they were thinking in terms of what they called design from the neck up, so psychology, as well as the kind of raw mechanical ergonomic uh, calculation that you might have had in previous generations. Would you look at it that way as well as a kind of psychological issue? Yeah, I mean, there's a thing called psychosomatic. Like our thought can yeah. be as powerful as an actual problem. Right. Um, you know, a lot of the times people, like even people, there's like a blanket term for pain and then they call it fibromyalgia. I mean, all that means is it's undiagnosed pain. Yeah. If you start telling yourself over and over again, I'm in pain, you will be in pain. Pain isn't a thing, it's a signal, just like a scent. <clears throat> so like with my patients, one of the biggest things that I practice within anything, but focus, if we just talk about pain, for example, I wouldn't allow them to say that they were in pain. I know that if we get you moving properly, pain will disappear. Mm. So if they wake up every morning and they say I have a chronic back issue, and they're telling the body that every single day, we need to break that circuit. So they would come to me and I would say, they, to let me know they're in pain, they would say, I just need to get my back moving today. And I'd yeah. say, okay, I'll, let's get your back moving today. Yeah. And just building that, that connection in the brain really shifted. And I think it's important to look at everything in life as a thought is very, very powerful. Mm. If I feel a cold coming on, I don't allow myself to say I'm getting sick. I say I need to be stronger today. I need right. to build my immune system today. Right. If I'm stressed out, I don't say I'm stressed. I say I'm experiencing resistance, but I know resistance makes me strong. And I think if you start thinking of everything that you're describing and thinking and saying, a, you can still mean the same thing, but you can also tell the body what you want. Right. And that might sound very woo-woo, but I promise I'm extremely science-backed and it's fascinating, especially with pain because most people are in pain and that's why we have have this opioid crisis yeah. and I think a large part of that is psychological um, mm. and super important to yeah. address never underestimate the power of the human mind right it's and actually it's, and it's true we're all basically we're all writing our own script all the time and then we're performing it right and if you don't allow yourself to be the script writer and think about what you're doing then where you're gonna end up right so Michelle what do you think about the implications of your work specifically in scent on other parts of the design industry? Do you see that architects are reacting to what you're telling them? How do they look at your work? Yeah, it's very exciting actually. It's a very exciting time. I, um, I'm finding that within the design space, there has been a large um, a gap in quality scent design. Like where is, is the luxury and thoughtful design behind scent so we can really complete and create a holistic experience. So, so I've been, we've been having really great feedback, a lot of excitement, um, a lot of interest in, in designing for the senses and bringing a space to life through the sense of smell. So it's been a really exciting journey and I think that there's so much room for innovation. There's the, the scent, the fragrance world has been so redundant ever since we went into this new pattern of like synthetics, which has now dominated the entire scent space that we exist in. There hasn't really been any radical change or transformation, and certainly not a lot of talk about the holistic health benefits of working with natural aromatic materials. I mean, COVID brought more awareness to that, and um, people are now understanding it. 15 years ago, it did feel a little bit more woo-woo, like aromatherapy and how can a scent affect us? But as we start to study more and we start to learn more and we start to understand that we're really smelling with our brain and this unique communication that takes place, it can be such a trigger for um, an emotional, you know, a deeper emotional connection to a space or to a place. So it's been a really exciting time to explore scent and design. And do you think there are opportunities in, let's say, textiles, fashion, Everything, furniture? Everything. Yeah. I mean, yeah. we're working in product development. So a lot of work with spas, a lot of work in the hospitality space where, again, it's all about that emotional connection to a space and memory. So yeah. that then has led us to, I mean, the wellness space is a natural area for us to be working in because that's the roots and foundation of my work and, and bioalchemy. But with fashion, I mean, I start to think about all of the materials that are porous and permeable that could be scented. And I, I want to put a smell on everything. 
<laughs> yeah, let's do it. So uh, last question and quick answers because I want to get some questions from the audience. Um, let's do some blue sky thinking here, by which I mean some future casting and sort of uh, thinking about what might be happening in 10 years from now, let's say. What are you hopeful about? What are you worried about? Where do you think, see things going, Katie? Yeah, it, yeah, great question. I, what I'm hopeful about is our ability to solve the sustainability challenge in the wellness space. Also worried about it, right? It, it's kind of one and the same, but really optimistic with all of you know the energy technology that's being developed, water filtration technology that's being developed, that we can you know continue to li deliver these really outstanding experiences and and leave behind a, even a lesser impact. Okay, uh, Jonathan? I'm just super excited to really think about self-care as a form of entertainment. You know, alcohol, if we look at the statistics and just what uh, the research is saying is alcohol consumption is drastically declining. And if we're not drinking alcohol with every generation drinking less and less, they're gonna need new experiences. Mm -hmm. um, and these new experiences can be fun. It can be the, the way they take care of themselves and, and can be how they connect to build stronger relationships. And I think, you know, what was, was like the most LA concept, like I, everyone would always say, John, a social wellness club, you're talking about human connection, that's so LA, but now people get it. And now to have studies come out like Harvard showing, no, we actually need healthy ways to connect, but I just want to make it fun. And yeah. I think if you, for everyone, we're all busy, we have a lot going on in life, but if you can have one experience that allows you to connect deeper take care of yourself and have enjoyment. That's a really powerful thing. And I think we're gonna see a lot of that. Yeah, LA isn't always wrong. I mean, you know, uh, and, and I guess there's actually a really powerful thing there about um, creating an opposing narrative to the kind of metaverse dematerialization direction of technology in the future, right? Which is a lot of what we hear from Silicon Valley, but you're talking about a material embodied version of the future. The more digital we go, the more unhealthy we will become. The more unhealthy. Unhealthy we will become. Yeah. yeah. Right. Okay. And Michelle, any last words about the future? Yeah. Well, I mean, I think also just to comment on what you're saying is like making social wellness fun. If anybody was at the remedy and, and, and Kohler activation at the edition at 4 p.m. yesterday, they all knew I was terrified to get in a six minute ice bath at 37 degrees. And so I had the pleasure of getting in the bath with Jonathan, and it transformed the experience completely. I went from sheer terror to laughing and dancing and like having fun in this ice bath and ready to do it again. So I think that was a perfect example of social wellness like at its finest. So mm. thank you for your support. Amazing. <laughs> um, but I'm hopeful that um, this trend towards naturals, this heightened sensory awareness that we're experiencing is something that that will hold up and that um, that this demand for more transparency and, and more information about what we're accessing, what we're using, what we're putting in and on our bodies um, will, will remain and it's, and it's a great opportunity for storytelling and deeper connection, deeper human connection and um, I think that with, with more reach and with more access to quality materials, natural medicine, natural scents, natural materials, we can um, connect more to like the visceral space and what's real and, yeah. and what's not. Yeah, it's that EM Forrester thing, right? Only connect, that's the motto, yeah. Definitely important at Design Miami and great examples of that in this conversation. Really amazing uh, discussion. Uh, questions, folks? Great to see so many of you out here listening to this conversation. Um, any, anybody have a question or comment? Please. Uh, maybe wait for the mic, hello, Dustin, hello. Dustin might come on up front, Dustin. Um, my capable colleague, Dustin Peters, is going to bring you the microphone. Thanks. Good afternoon. Um, I'm quite stoked about the conversation. Um, being an arts and an architect myself, I, I gravitate towards the conversation so much because it's a conversation I talk about all the time and people are like you're crazy how smell and all of this thing's gonna change you know and um the main thing that i found from you is like it's all about frequency 
and presence and understanding oneself as a human being and how your body actually works and not going against that and resisting that. And in terms of like aromatics, I find that something as simple as a fart, like if I were to fart now, we'll all be moving, you know, but it's a very natural thing. And it's one of the things that's actually very healing and that needs to be excreted from the body, right? But it's one of the things that we actually reject, you know, and it's, I mean, it doesn't smell good, which is one of the questions that I also want to ask you is that how do you deal with a sense that don't smell good but are actually necessary, you know? Because it's yeah. not everything that's going to be all rosy and flowery and all of this stuff. And now we are at this, you know, world where everything is so aesthetic and pleasurable that we reject the things that are unpleasurable but that are actually good for us. So how do you deal that in your field in terms of like aromatherapy and, and all of that? Um, the other question that I also want to ask you um, in terms of the work that you do, it's very long term because it's a lifestyle change and we live in a very instant gratification um, gratified world, right? So how do you change someone's perception and saying, oh, instead of taking this drug that will seemingly help you instantly, oh, come do this, go in an ice bath for how many ever days or for the rest of your life, you know, and this person is maybe in chronic pain. How do you deal with sort of telling people that that seems like the solution at the current position in time, but it actually isn't. It's actually something that's gonna drag you down and you're just gonna be very dependent on it overall, as opposed to taking the leap of faith and actually you know, moving forward, but seemingly stepping back and sitting with that pain at that particular moment or that resistance at that particular moment for you to actually move forward. So yeah, that's Thank my you. questions. Anyone like to speak to that? Yeah. Sure. So, well, for one, I, I live in New York City, so I'm smelling everything. The good, the bad, the ugly. Um, but I think that all scents are information, and so there may be some scents that can alert us to danger, or, for example, if you're eat, tasting something and, you know, you have that feeling like it's gone rancid or bad, and, and, like, it's a signal to our brain to stop eating it. So I think that it's important to be aware of all sensory encounters and smells and, and look at them more as information and rather, like, oh, this smells good or this smells bad. Mm. I think it's more to heighten our awareness and bring us, like, bring our attention to something. Yeah. All information is helpful, right? Other questions? Yeah, one in the back next to Dustin. Hi, how are you? Uh, I have sort of a question about this idea of technology, but then also getting this information out. So I'm, I'm going to try to keep it as concise as possible. How do you get this information that you're trying to convey and create that sort of tipping point without, without these devices, without the technology? Not to say we can't use them, but it feels like, you know, to your point, they've sort of taken over our lives, but they're causing all of this strain on the body, on the mind. And so how do you, I guess, get people onto the other side, right? Onto this healthy side without using these things. Does that make sense? I think we, we have to use them. So it's learning how to do it in moderation and safe ways. I think creating experiences that can allow you to be removed from them and making that turn into a routine because the more that you have a routine that turns into a habit and habit turns into change and to answer your question, it's starting small. You don't have to do all or nothing. You know, it's just moving more and more in the right direction and everything that is slightly better will bring you to be better. And I think it's a lifelong thing, so it's not about I have to have this in 30 days or 60 days. It's what can you do for the rest of your life? And every day our physiology is different, so that might have to change and evolve. And I think. For me, I always look at everything in my life and I audit it. I do it daily, weekly, monthly. And I think as you start auditing those things, whether it's your environment, your relationships, your work, you can start thinking of the factors that are enhancing you or working against you. But the technology is tough because um, I think we're only going to become, you know, with AI and all of these things happening, it's figuring out how to use them as a tool. Um, and then find ways to also be removed from it. Yeah, I think the metaphor is technology, digital technology makes a great door, but it's a terrible room. So if you can use it as a way to get somewhere else that's real, that's fantastic, but dwelling inside it is obviously where you get sicker, right? Yeah, so literally words to live by, guys. Thank you so much. Um, what an amazing conversation.